Uh, so the title is the ordering ratio function and traveling sentiment breakpoint for, for groups and metric spaces. So it's an algebra day. So the topic is actually much more dramatic than algebraic, but um, I hope to explain uh, there is some, we hope to have some particular meaning uh, when the metric space is a group. And so there is some, hopefully some algebra um, in the story as well. So I explain the problem. So we are studying some invariants and some of them we believe new invariants of um, metric spaces of finite generated groups um, relating to the traveling salesman problem, right? What is traveling salesman's problem? Probably you know that we have some metric space uh, M, for example, a, a graph or, or another metric, right? And we have some finite subs number of points number of cities in the initial problem, right? And the traveling uh, salesman wants to find the shortest path to visit, uh, to visit these points. And there are many algorithms um, for, for example, for, for finding graph to, to find the shortest path and uh, they require, this is NP hard problem. So it's, uh, if you want uh, to find the precise solution, um, it's not so quick to, to, to evaluate the shortest path, but we are interested uh, and not in the exact solution. We are interested in some nice estimate of the shortest path. And, maybe I give some definition. So we'll be considering the following function. Yes, so, and um, we will be speaking about the universal traveling salesman problem. What does it mean universal? Universal tra salesman uh, uh, traveling pro uh, problem. Uh, it's um, a problem that uh, was started uh, with uh, the works uh, of um, John Bartholdi and Platzman in the eighties um, for the plane. And um, the question is we want to enumerate all the points of our space, let's say for, for the moment, let's think that the space is discrete, right? not so very important. Uh, anyway, we consider some order on the points of our set. And uh, given a set, subset X, uh, like we have here, when we have this subset X, uh, we want to visit. We don't, uh, we don't uh, make a particular calculation to estimate the shortest path for X. We just use the same order of all points of M and uh, say, we, we, we want to visit the points of X in this prescribed order. It gives us some approximation of, of the shortest path. So oh, uh, here, here's the definition we consider, right? So we consider the set uh, which contains at most uh, K points and we, we, we look on the ratio of, of some, uh, some length given of an order on our metric space divided by the optimal path. If we want to know how large is this ratio, some, what are easy examples, some more or less obvious example, if our metric space is a line, right? So metric space is a line, well, very easy to, uh, to, to, to find the shortest path. You just visit uh, in the linear order of the line, right? Um, so the ratio is equal to one, and very easy to see if you have a if you have a, a tree, then then uh, the ratio is at most two. Here uh, the picture shows um, uh, uh, shows uh, uh, the uh, the order on, on a tree, right? So if you have a tree, we just draw this tree. And then uh, this orange path uh, visit all points at most twice, right? And we consider the order that corresponds to the first visit. It's very easy to see the ratio is at most two. So, so some spaces that have a more or less trivial estimate for us um, are, um, are metric trees. And um, maybe I'll come back to that. Uh, we, we can see another quality of what we call traveling salesman breakpoint. We consider this function, uh, function measures uh, how an order on a space can estimate uh, the shortest path and um, um, uh, traveling salesman breakpoint is uh, the value, the first value where this uh, ratio, uh, the, the, this function is smaller than K. So an obvious estimate for our function O of K, O of K is obviously at most, at most K. 
unique f k plus one points, we have some diameter and whatever in whatever order we visit the points, we will have at most k times diameter. So, so uh, it's no, if the ratio is k, it's the worst possible case. It means the order was absolutely absurd, right? To, to estimate the um, ordering ratio and function. And we, we, when we look on the values, on the first values, where we don't have k, where something reasonable uh, happens with the order. And these are two quantities we want to study. So this story starts with um, what is called Bartholdi Platson algorithm. Yes, so uh, maybe I, I have to mention so uh, because not related to, so far to, to the topic of my talk. So I have so many um, talk, uh, no, not talk, so many works with Laran Bartholdi on growth of groups. So uh, when I mention Bartholdi, some people always think. I'm speaking about Laurent Bartholdi, but it's uh, quite another Bartholdi, right? So somebody in computer scientist, a um, well-known computer scientist, who introduced in the 80s um, an algorithm to, um, to estimate traveling statesman for, for, for the plane. And here's the idea of Bartholdi and Platzman. Uh, consider a square. It's not very important if you consider a finite square on infinite. It's easy to see, it's more or less the same. But consider, for example, the finite square. What is a good way to order the points of the square? So here, for example, on the right hand side here, it's a lexicographic order of the plane. This is a, uh, uh, this is a very bad order for us. It's very easy to see. Oh, uh, this our function will be equal to k if we, we order the uh, points of the plane lexicographically. This is not good, but uh, observation, uh, crucial observation of Bartholdi plasma that on the plane, if uh, if you consider some self uh, space filling curve, uh, some piano type curve, right, uh, like drawn on the picture, and then we consider the order corresponding to 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 um, to this uh, um, to this curve, right. So here it's uh, explained a little bit better on this picture, right. So. Uh, so we can see we consider this curve. We visit all points of, for example, all integer points here of the square uh, following this curve, and we consider the order of uh, corresponding to the first visit of the curve. This is some uh, uh, so some order on on a square, for example, two times n, two times n square, and um, and uh, uh, the observation of Bartholdi and Plasman. Um, in, in was that if you consider the prob the, the the competitive ratio uh, in terms of the of cardinality of uh, number of points? So in the notation we introduce now it's our, uh, this function or of k. So Bartholdi and Plasman just show that this is a, oh, it, um, the Bartholdi and Plasman showed that in the case of the plane in in, in the case of this particular order. Or ORFK is at most constant time logarithm, logarithm k, right? And um, when we found this algorithm, uh, actually at first they believed that uh, the ratio is even better. So they had the wrong guess um, at first. They said, okay, we, we show that uh, there is a logarithmic estimate, but they, they wrote explicitly in one of their papers, we hope that the ratio is constant. The ratio is not constant, right? So uh, soon it was realized uh, for this particular order, lower bound is also logarithmic. And, but the question is, what, what is the best possible order? This problem is open even on Z2, but it's known, maybe I didn't write it. So if you consider any order T, an arbitrary order in Z2, it's known that there is log some power estimate um, like uh, something like one, uh, one over six, log one over six of k estimate as a lower bound, a reasonable conjecture that this logarithm is asymptotically optimal and this is not known. And uh, here I, uh, I wouldn't say something, something new, but um, maybe before explaining to theorem A, I go directly to theorem B. So um, uh, first question we ask, what are spaces where the ratio is best possible meaning constant, right? And uh, one of the results we, we prove, uh, we show that if uh, um, space is delta hyperbolic, 
let's say you would graph of bounded, bounded degree or some, or some, some, some uh, hyperbolic of some bounded geometry, then uh, in particular, if you take any finitely generated hyperbolic group, right? Uh, one of the, uh, the first results, we show that ordering ratio function is at most constant. Maybe I say a few words uh, about the proof a little bit later and and so, but several questions we address. So with, with some best possible situation, right? Which happens for that hyperbolic or FK is greater, is not, is bounded by a constant. This is extremely good, right? But still very good, like for the plane, that if we have something smaller than logarithm, and we'll discuss in a moment when it happens. And, um, and, and we'll discuss also what that uh, con conjecture, that there will be some dichotomy actually of what can happen. But first I explain uh, uh, what happens, what uh, one can expect about logarithmic bound. So um, as I have mentioned for the plane, uh, there is logarithmic bound, this is Bartholdian plasmon. And then uh, the case of the plane was generalized for Euclidean spaces. And as, um, uh, according to our knowledge, the most general case that was known until now is spaces with a, with a doubling property. Uh, a result of Gia and, and Kaofas show if you have a space with doubling property, then there is an upper logarithmic bound. But, uh, but um, so, it turns out that a much more general um, assumption suffice. So as you, as you know, so among groups, for example, only nilpotent groups and exactly nilpotent groups, right, have, have the doubling property. So, um, so to, as I mentioned, um, we believe that uh, so far it was known only, so there, there were no groups of not polynomial growth uh, where something would be known. And now uh, we prove one of the results we show that if you if um, Asuada Nagata dimension of the metric space is finite, and then um, and then uh, there is a logarithmic upper bound. So let's just explain it if you if you logarithmic bound, right? And so now we have many examples um, of um, of exponential growth, right? So here I uh, remind uh, some examples. So uh, okay, hyperbolic groups uh, have to find a certain kind of dimension. This is not so interesting, maybe because after all we have even a stronger claim here, bounded by a constant, as I just mentioned. But also uh, a leaf product of Z uh, with a finite group. Um, uh, Polycyclic groups um, by, by result of Iches and Pienk uh, for, well, for, for, for Reef products, Brodsky, Dideck, and Lang, right? Um, uh, so uh, anything that, uh, that, that can be quasi-symmetrically embedded into um, into product of these as hyperbolic groups, right? Uh, virtually special groups, mapping Lux groups, and that's the hyperbolic with respect to to, to something of finite so nagata dimension. It has um, has finite so nagata dimension, right? So we have uh, plenty of examples now where, where we have a logarithmic bound, and actually, actually we, we ask that moreover it might be if and only if. So maybe I ask directly the question and then explain some some um, results. Mm. Yes. So as I said, our theorem says if a certain negative dimension is finite, then we have a logarithmic bound. But we we show uh, we ask uh, if uh, if the dimension is infinite. Is it true that traveling sentiment pro pro point is infinite? Um, by definition, this means R of K is equal to K by every K. And in general, this is not known, uh, but in particular, if this would be true, um, this would be would imply that there is a following dichotomy, right? The following gap for, for the ratio functions. So we ask that maybe all this, uh, the following is true. Either there is this logarithmic bound similar uh, like for the plane, right? Or maybe we are really always in the worst possible situation where the function of k is equal to k. But before explaining these questions, maybe I formulate two results in this direction. So, 
maybe first I explain a spectral condition, right? So uh, what was so, so so far as we know, um, uh, it seems that only some generalization of Euclidean um, case, like the, the doubling we studied, and the only results we know not about something close to Euclidean are the books of Gradetsky and co-office and Kalgat and co-office who study Ram, who have studied Ramanujan graphs. For, for this property of uh, universal um, um, traveling statement problem. So, um, so the, the, um, these two results uh, have shown that if you have a sequence of Ramanujan graphs, um, with some, they also had some assumption of the Gilf moreover, they have shown that in our, in our terminology, it, they have shown that OR of K is greater than constant times K. Uh, they have shown a linear, the results um, imply the linear bound uh, uh, on K if we have a sequence of, of Ramanujan graphs with certain conditions. Now, um, uh, it turns out that a much weaker spectral assumption is sufficient. So here it's uh, stated in our theorem D, right? So if the relaxation time that is one over the spectral gap is or, or, or small of log divided by log log of, of the cardinality of the graph, then we, we show that traveling sentiment point is infinite. This seems to be new even for Ramanujan graphs because they, uh, so, as I said, the previous results um, provide uh, linear bound, but we show that really or of k is equal to k. And now it's particular, the, our assumption is verified if you have any sequence of expander graphs, so not important at all the, to have something Ramanujan. And, um, and we have some, some graphs without, um, without expansion. And um, so this is, uh, this is one, um, one of the results um, that already for a large class of, of something of uh, infinite dimension uh, shows that, um, that um, uh, shows that, uh, um, or of k is equal to k. Um, and another result, so uh, sp now, now uh, let's speak about groups, right? So this is about graphs. So in particular, the known results can be used uh, to already to construct some groups um, with, uh, with uh, linear um, ordering ratio function. So, so uh, take, take a sequence of Ramanujan graphs. Uh, by, by, by result of, of a side, you know that uh, if you uh, assume that the, you have uh, this um, linear diameter to, to your ratio uh, for a sequence of graphs, then uh, by, by relatively recent result of a side, right, so you can embed this sequence into a finally generated group. But this, is, this will give you some group with a linear behavior, but this is um, a bit uh, uh, complicated procedure, right? Already the existence of Ramanujan graphs is uh, already a remarkable um, observation, right? And then um, you use um, this, uh, this modern uh, small constellation technique to embed it in a group. This is one way to do, but uh, now it's not necessary actually, but because now there are very easy examples. So I explain you some very easy examples with something with O R of K is equal to K. So what we show that if you have some space which um, uh, uh, admits in a very weak sense, large cubes of arbitrary dimension, then, uh, then O R of K is e equal to K. The traveling assessment point, uh, break point is equal to infinity. Maybe I don't explain in detail um, what does it mean weakly contained cubes, but um, here I listed something in particular. If, uh, for example, if you have in the group, if you have um, ZD quasi isometrically or uniformly embedded in your group. So take, for example, Reef product of Z with Z, right? This is a particular case of uh, what we show, right? So in this case, uh, our conclusion or of k is or of k is equal to k, and the breakpoint is infinite, right? Uh, so um, this is already again. Again, so um, I, I remind that many many papers um, that estimate provide some estimate of a certain Nagatak dimension uh, in many in many examples. Uh, use some some kind of cubes uh, embedded in the space 
So here, maybe some picture to illustrate some. It's well known, right? If you take uh, by again by Brodsky did the clunk, right? If you take Z2 brief product Z to Z, then a so Nagata dimension is infinite. Um, their argument is a bit different, but um, it, it, it can be shown also that um, in our tenor homology, for example, if you take the relief product, in, inside the, the, there is some embedding of cubes. So he, here this picture explains how to embed ZD in the two-dimensional reef product. Here the picture is for Z to the power of three, right? So, so you can see that some walls of certain radius uh, around the points um, of the lattice. And then you consider several subsets. So if the mention is D, you consider these subsets and you color them in some color. So here on the, this picture, we, we have colored. So there is one set which is yellow, another set which is uh, red, another set which is which is um, which is green, right? And and so uh, uh, how you embed the D. So if you have some point. Uh, I don't know, here D equal in the picture T D equal to three, Z1, Z2, Z3. Mm. Then, uh, for example, here take Z1 on the picture, Z1 is equal to nine, Z2 is equal to three, uh, Z3 is, seems to be equal to five, right? Just consider the configuration. In the red set, uh, since we have some nine, uh, choose uh, is it nine? No, in the yellow set. In the yellow set, uh, first coordinate is nine. Choose nine ones. Choose nine points in the yellow set um, because we have nine. In a, in the second coordinate is three. So we we choose in the second set which is which is uh, red, right? We, we choose three um, points um, and we put the value on the equation is equal to one. We put three we, on on the first set. For example, we have something for five, right? We choose five points and we put ones there and zero elsewhere. And uh, this explains how to embed uh, weekly, weekly uh, Z, uh, um, ZD in the two dimensional leaf product. So this is a particular case of, of, um, of, of our theorem. So any space that ad, um, admits weekly some, some embeddings of, um, of some embedding of large, large cubes. Um, uh, uh, has infinite uh, traveling assessments breakpoint. So um, maybe I say a few words um, about previous results first. So yes, uh, these are some results, right? So these two theorem, theorem D and theorem E, this is to make this question about a sort Nagata dimension. We don't know actually a possible count examples. It seems tricky, especially for groups already to find some group that would violate uh, the assumptions of both um, of both our theorems, right? So um, um, uh, that's why we ask, um, this is one of the reasons we ask uh, this question that maybe we had this dichotomy, either uh, ordering ratio function is relatively good uh, uh, bounded by logarithm, or we have this worst possible case, this function is equal to, to or of k is equal to k, right? So maybe I mentioned, uh, as I said, already a, a large varieties of uh, classes of groups is covered by our theorem, but if we use uh, simply the definition of a sad Nagata dimension, not much is known, so maybe I mentioned, so after we stated this question, after this address to this question of relation to Asad Naga, the dimension, oh, I have something on the screen, which I'm not sure how to, I'm not sure how to remove, oh, no, it's okay, right? So maybe I mentioned Karim Adiprazita, Adiprazita. has recently shown after we asked this question, if a Suad Nagata dimension is infinite, at least you are not bounded by a constant. Not bounded by a constant. 
But as I said, we can a much, much stronger claim is, uh, is true. And, and um, uh, we, we expect that it's linear, linear even with the best possible coefficient in case uh, the dimension is infinite. Maybe um, I say a few words about the proofs, and but I explain maybe state um, the last result. So, so one one question is about spaces and finding a best possible order on the space, at least asymptotically, right? And um, as, as I said, we expect that maybe there is dichotomy. Either you you are logarithmic or you, you, the function is linear. Now I would like to mention a, even a stronger problem with uh, one can ask. So far uh, in Bartoldi uh, plasma algorithm, even on the plane, usually one search best or best orders, right? One search some orders uh, where you have some, so, so, some bound. But it seems that maybe one hasn't studied the following question, which, uh, which we study now. Let's look on all orders on our metric space not necessarily searching the best the best possible order uh, i have some problem can you see if you are right here <coughs> is it okay yes, yes. but yes. Uh, if you could move your text a little bit to the left yes uh, to the left no no this we see uh like the theorem yeah now we can see it yes yeah thank you <laughs> so I wanted to mention one one more result, um, in, in, which is the following: we have our metric space. Uh, so far, we discussed um, what is the best possible um, way to to choose the order. But now, let us consider all the orders on the space, and this result seems to, to be new even in the case of Z two. So this is. Um, this is result about spaces with doubling. And I don't know why the okay. So take something with doubling, for example, simply Z2, and consider some order of the points of the set, for example, some order of the integer points of, of Z2 of the plane. And what we show that either this function is extremely bad, or the function for any k is equal to k, or we have a logarithmic bound. So maybe I return to the original papers, uh, pictures related to Bartoldi and Palasman. Yes, yeah. So the, our theorem says, Whatever order you take uh, on the D or on a space with doubling, either it's really like the geographical order, for example, on the two, where R of K is equal to K, either the order is extremely bad, or, um, or, uh, or you have logarithmic bound like uh, for, for this order related to self-filling curves. Uh, in particular, it, it gives also some um, possibly new way uh, to, to, to show known results about just Bartholdi plasma orders, right? So when you have an order to, to, to check that we have a logarithmic bound, it is sufficient to consider one single value of k. It's sufficient to, 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 to consider some value of k and to show that O or of k is not equal to k, right? Explains some meaning of this logarithm bound. It explains so far there is some value or of k is not equal to k. Our theorem says then you have a logarithmic bound. Right? And maybe I return. Uh, to the beginning. So, as I said, one of um, maybe um, of a gen of the general um, ideas present in several results here. We know, in principle, we are interested at most in the asymptotics of of the function. But um, something that we are looking at 
we are looking, uh, we are interested in the topic of, of, of our key, but after all, we managed to prove uh, or, uh, to bound or of k for particular value of case. So maybe I just return to this question of traveling sensor point. So tra traveling sensor point is some value where or of k is not equal to k. Right. So maybe I comment. So already some first results to understand what this what this value look like. Right. So um, uh, I didn't explain yet uh, the theorem A. Right. So first of all, what are possible values of of traveling segment traveling traveling segment trade point trade point? Just by definition, this is something which is at least two, right? We need at least three points to, to, to speak something about traveling assessment problem and the order. So if you have only two points, whatever, or in whatever order we visit them, you just the distance between two points, right? If, um, first possible value is two. And here it's, uh, uh, here it's not so difficult to see that uh, um, uh, either you have something quasi semantic to a line, to a point or to a ray, let's say you, you take, take, for example, some, some geodesic metric space, then if you have a line, if you have a ray, then this value TS break is equal to two. And if our space is geodesic, M is geodesic, Basic, um, it's if and only if, if and only if the value is equal to, to two, if and only if uh, you have a, a, lay, a ray or a line or a point, uh, geodesic, if and only if. And this is related to to a result of Misha Kapovich about tripods. Because there is a characterization of spaces which have non-trivial tripods, right? Like this uh, embedded in our space. So first of all, it's easy to see if you really have a line or array, we have the value two. And uh, um, uh, by result of Mishkapovich, if you you have something not quite isometric to, to the array and line, you have larger and larger tripods inside uh, inside uh, our uh, space, right? And then you can show the value is at least three. So the, really, the smallest value is two. And but um, now next value right, is two. It's just easy to see, right? Uh, and uh, then the next value is three. So our theorem describes what's happened. If TS break is equal to three, okay. it's equal to three. When it's equal to two for groups, it's really either your virtually Z um, or finite, right? Uh, but um, uh, now what we show in theorem A that uh, TS break is equal to three if and only if um, if you have a virtually free group. So it provides uh, already um, a characterization of free groups in this terminology, right? And um, this is uh, closely related to Stolling's theorem. So um, say a few words about the proof. So uh, the proof of this theorem is as follows. Um, uh, there are two cases, right? So the, the main thing to show you, you have some group which is not virtually free, right? So we have G not virtually free. Not virtually. Three. Then we want to show that TS break is is at least um, is at least four, right? So he, here there are two cases. So um, one idea is to to use the ends of groups. So um, uh, one lemma to show that if if our group ha um, is one ended, then we we we, we, we show that TS break is at least four, right? One first observation: If you have one end, then this TS break break is at least four. This is the first thing. 
in, 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 now after after we prove it, um, um, we, we use just uh, Stolling theorem and um, accessibility of finally presented groups. Now there are two cases: either our, our group is finally presented or it's infinitely presented. If it's finally presented, it really just you, you use accessibility, right? So um, you, you you reduce it so in particular inside of it the um, if it's not virtually virtually free the, there is some one one ended group right um, and uh, and since you, you have the subgroup inside it gives you the bound TS break um, um, is at least four and the other case is uh, is when our group is infinitely generated infinitely generated generated Waited. Um, and then we also want to, to show that TS break um, is at least four. And here the idea is follows. If the group is in, infinitely generated, it's clear that inside this group, first of all, there are nicely embedded uh, circles, which are larger and larger. That goes to the page. Let's see, it comes. Yes, um, so if you consider the case when G is uh, infinitely generated, first of all, there are circles nicely embedded, which are larger and larger, but this is not enough. Um, but one can show also that if the group is infinitely generated, then inside you, you can have something um, we don't know exactly, um, it might be true that uh, inside, uh, we don't know if inside the, there is a domino figures larger and larger, but we rather use trimino figures. So we can see that the graph, which is trimino of, of this form, right? So, trimino of this. And we don't need that it's quasi-metrically embedded, but we want that some part of this graph uh, are quasi-metrically embedded. And uh, one can see if, uh, if the group is infinitely generated, you can have larger and larger pictures like this. And here in the second case, the main thing is to estimate um, estimate this value of the traveling sentence breakpoint for, for these trimino graphs. And um, you show also that is about there is a bound by four. And in the second case, we, we use this, um, um, this um, possibly distorted, but uh, this nicely controlled trimino inside our graph and to, to claim that uh, TS break is at least four. This is about theorem A. And it's difficult, so, okay, as I said, uh, the value is equal to two for the groups. It's if and only if you, you are virtually Z. If this value is equal to three, it's if and only if uh, the group is uh, virtually free. And uh, in, in, it's interesting, but uh, much more challenging to understand what happens next, right? So uh, what happens is this value is equal to four, is equal to five, mm, we don't know. Um, maybe, maybe I say a few words also about the hyperbolic theorem now. So, um, uh, what is the idea to prove theorem B about hyperbolic spaces? So, uh, so here mainly we need to, to prove the theorem. It's clear that it's enough to prove this theorem for standard hyperbolic space HD. Here on the picture, it's a hyperbolic plane, which is drawn right here we have H2. And here, and some we use in the proof, uh, here on the picture, you see just a standard tessellation of a hyperbolic plane, right? So these the squares, each one um, is connected to five other squares, right? And, and so we, we are interested in H2, for example, and, uh, and it's not so important whether we consider the cold space or something quite as a metric to this space. Yes, I didn't explain. So uh, this function we consider, it's easy to see it's some quasi isometric invariant. One should be uh, a little bit careful. It's not quasi isometric invariant um, as it is if we don't assume anything about the space. But if you we can see, assume that the, the space uh, is uniformly discrete, for example, if we assume that the distance between, between any two points um, is at least um, um, some constant, then it's easy to see the and um, the function. This function we can see that 
it does not change if two spaces are quasi isometric, right? So this function is simple, quasi isometric invariant, right? And now, so uh, consider this tessellation and rather consider, consider just the centers of this uh, tessellation and consider the corresponding graph, right? Corresponding graph, the boring graph. And we, we, we want uh, to, to show that ordering ratio function is bounded by constant. First of all, by a theorem of Bonk and Schramm, right? Bonk and Schramm. And as you know, if you have uh, something uh, delta hyperbolic um, of bounded geometry, it can be quasi isometric embedded to, to HD, right? To a standard hyperbolic space. So the main question for us is really about HD, for example, for H2. And uh, here, how we do it. So the main thing is to, to, to show that uh, the, the, this constant bound holds for, for HD. The idea is as follows. We choose some order on, on, on the vertices um, of this tessellation, for example, right? And the choice of this order is depicted on this picture. Consider the following three, right? So in the in, in, uh, in our tessellation, consider the tree which is drawn uh, with red, right? And like as if a usual tree, consider the order, uh, uh, consider this green path that goes around the tree and consider the order of, of, of the first visit of a point. This is our order we will stand. And we will show that this order will, will be sufficient to, to assure a con constant, constant bound. So, but attention, of course, we have uh, clearly this, uh, these trees uh, in a hyperbolic plane, for example, but um, clearly our space is not quite isometric to, uh, to, to a tree. It turns out that this order is quite good for our purposes, uh, but also some remark. It's maybe not surprising that uh, so, so, so some, uh, so some relation of hyperbolic spaces to this is helpful for us, but, but attention. So this particular tree I have drawn here is an approximation tree, as you know, very good, right? If you have something delta hyperbolic, if you have, if you have some finite number of points, you can find a tree, right? You can approximate a metric by, by a tree metric with some logarithmic bound uh, error, right? But a priori, just attention, if you have some approximation t, a priori, it doesn't provide any estimate, um, any estimate on ordering ratio function. First of all, uh, first of all, because we consider any subset of the t, so it's not the same equation as on the error, it's just um, approximating the distances between the points. And um, so we don't a priori get even logarithmic upper bound. And even in such case you get it, it's not what we want. We want really a constant bound, right? But um, so just to, to use a well-known lemma about approximation is not useful for us, but it turns out that this order is, uh, is good for our purposes. So we have just some number of points, some number of points, and we want to estimate the traveling assessment so, so we have some optimal path, right? We have some number of points uh, in this uh, hyperbolic graph, which is quite a metric to, to hyperbolic plane, for example, and, or hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic space is uh, good as well, right? And we want to estimate uh, the optimal path and the path um, which is given by this ordering of, of the space. And we just look, um, so, the ordering, look on the order the points are visited. It's not uh, necessarily the same order as in the optimum buff. We first go somewhere, one, two, maybe we go three and so on, right? And when we consider on the uh, consider the geodesic between these points, for example, one to two, two to three and so on, how the geodesic and hyperbolic plane look like? So we have two points right here and here, and then the Quasi the geodesic, uh, even the geodesic looks more or less like this, right? You go much higher up to certain level, then you, you displace a little bit in the horizontal layer and you go downstairs, right? You can see that this standard, so, so standard uh, quasi geodesic, right? So um, uh, estimate the length of this quasi geodesic we get. First of all, it can happen, right? We consider this union of these quasi geodesics, one to two, two to three, and so on. Um, three to four and so on. It's possible that some point of, of our graph we visited more than once, but what is essential, we will visit only a bounded number of points. So the first observation, the number of, of, of vertices of our graph 
there is a bound, right? So you visit at most uh, constant time um, each point. And so, so, uh, so to estimate the length, it's sufficient to, esti to estimate the cardinality of the point, right? And um, now you have something, something of optimal length. So you have some curve and you, you, you add some, some paths, as I said, not, not, not at all in this order. But what is important, you add each time, let's say, a geodesic. It's something like a convex related to a convex hull, even, even less, right? So you add some geodesic, you have some point, and you add some geodesic. And then in, in, if your space is hyperbolic, there is the, the, this bound, the, this linear bound, that the number of points is at most linear. So I think I have to finish soon. Um, uh, um, Maybe I mentioned that, okay, we have this statement about hyperbolic spaces, right? What one can show that it's not, the space shouldn't necessarily be hyperbolic to have this bound. There are some easy examples we study. Maybe draw some easy example. If you consider a space like this, so on. There are some spaces which are not directly hyperbolic where, where, you have, um, where you have a constant bound as well, but we don't know so far any finitely generated group, uh, which is not hyperbolic and we, which would have this bound. Clearly, if, if, the if, any, if you take any group which has Z2 inside, Z2 subgroup inside, for example, if you take any polycyclic group, right, right, then um, uh, no hope, right? So already Z2 uh, has unbounded on the rank ratio function. So you can't have a constant, but we, don't, we haven't understood so far good um, what happens for certain groups without that two suburb inside. And um, so thank you very much. So I, uh, I think I will end my talk here. Thank you very much. Let's thank Sonia. So are there questions? May I ask questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. yes, uh, yes. Question is, uh, is a spectral theory of graphs uh, involved in this activity? Well, as, as, yes, I mentioned something, right? One of our results, and this is very much related to what, what happens for, um, with Asuad Nagata dimension, right? Uh, we have a sufficient criteria that TS break is, is infinite. Maybe I mentioned some examples just to illustrate it. So this, this spectral condition, right? What is clear, for example, so you see this, the, the behavior of spectral gap is very much related to traveling sense and breakpoint. What is clear, you can't have, you, even if you know exactly uh, the, uh, the, uh, the asymptotic of the spectral gap, uh, you, you can't understand whether traveling sense is finite or infinite. So it couldn't be a characterization really. For some cases, it could be finite, it could be infinite, right? The same as with the Sword Nagata dimension actually already. So uh, you can't uh, understand everything in terms of spectral gap, but still you can ask for best possible estimate in terms of, of, of the spectral gap. Just maybe I remind you some well-known example. Take for example, a reef product of uh, Z with Z to Z, usual lamp lighting, right? Yes. So uh, a result of, um, of uh, Grigorchuk and Chuk, right? shows you have log square log square log square of an e now terminology right here for the spectral gap and here certainly we cannot uh, claim that uh, traveling says well, breakpoint is infinite because because we know that as Nagata dimension in this case is finite, right? So so by our, our, our other theorem, we know so far that as Aswad Nagata dimension is finite, we really have a logarithmic bound and traveling sense and break, break, break point is finite, right? So um, so one can ask also, so this uh, logarithm squared is important because a recent more recent results of the Sera Hume the Sera and Mackey, Mackey, show that in terms of a Suad Nagata dimension, 
this lamp light examples are worst possible case for, for, for finding the sort of Nagata dimension. So they, they have the, basically this criteria, criteria when in terms of the spectral gap, a sort of Nagata dimension is infinite, right? But so, so this is related, but as I said, both for a sort of Nagata dimension and for, for these uh, functions we study, uh, we can discuss this sufficient criteria, but it cannot, uh, it can never be a reformulation. You, you, you can't hope to, exp to, to explain, um, yes, maybe, uh, yes, maybe I don't have time to explain. So there are two things, uh, this function we discuss for this, if a spectral gap is not bounded, there are sufficient condition, but they don't, you, you, you can't have a characterization. Something special happens for expanders when the spectral gap is really bounded. This is a second part of the theorem that I don't have time maybe to explain. So, so in this case, for something stronger than simply claiming that ordering ratio function of K is equal to K can be set. If you, we have a, a sequence of expander graphs, actually one can, explain that there are some what we call snakes that whatever ordering you take, there are some jumps like this. So something smaller than this, smaller than this, smaller than this. And what we show there are snakes of bounded width. In general, it's not true. A ordering ratio function could be linear, right? So we can have our claim. But in case when, when we assume moreover that the, uh, there is a spectral gap, so if you have a really a true expanders as a sequence of our graphs, then the, the, there, are, the, the, there are snakes of bounded width. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a lot, in, in there are, um, so there we have some results and there are many questions in this direction. So it's very much, it's very much related to certain spectral questions, but, um, but, but some aspects um, still go away from, from, from spectral conditions. Okay. I, don't, I don't know if I answered the question. Okay, thank you, thank you. Enough for today.